Slade always, uh, he liked traditional uh, things on vessels. So Slade on the Coastal Queen had a real air whistle. And he had it, you know, down in the engine room, there was an air compressor, and basically its total function was to blow the whistle. Slade Dale was a very, very practical person. He was not cheap, but he was careful. The reason that he built the high superstructure was that going up and down the intercoastal waterway, a good bit of it is what they call the low country. So you have, you know, miles and miles of marshes, but you also have a seven to eight foot tide in lots of areas. So if you're low tide with a standard boat, all you see is marsh grass. So it was basically give people a view. The big bench seat in back of the wheel on the uh, Coastal Queen was designed for the passengers to sit there so they had this big panoramic view through the uh, pilot house windows. On boats, um, space is always at a premium because there's so little of it. Uh, with this boat, it's even more so because it's, uh, <clears throat> it's a work boat that was never meant to have uh, living quarters below decks. So <clears throat> when you walk through the boat, very little headroom, um, it's cramped, it's dark, you know. So we're trying to, we're trying to change all that. So basically what we're trying to do here is we're trying to fit a lot of stuff into a very small space. So um, right now what I'm doing is I'm sort of mocking up the foredeck area, uh, putting cleats in where they are, um, or where they might be rather. Uh, we're gonna start fitting um, some winches around the mast and whatnot. And basically what we're doing is we're adding layers to this, this photo. Um, and just making sure that everything uh, will work with everything else. So, you know, you find out doing this that if you have a conflict between a winch and a cleat or something, you find that out very quickly. This is a really good exercise to, uh, to do, um, especially when you have so much going on in such a small space. A lot of times we will go straight from a two-dimensional drawing to a three-dimensional mock-up in the actual boat. We will take the measurements that we that we pick up off of the drawings and we will take you know cardboard or door skin or what have you and we will actually recreate it inside the boat full uh, full scale this surface here all the way around is going to be a, a bulkhead right here that will create the uh, the bathroom on this side when this was a working boat i mean you had a pilot house that slept a few people in the back of the boat and this is a it's a different boat now. I mean, we're, we're, you know, we want, you know, between six and 10 to be, you know, guests to be accommodated plus crew, um, you know, and, and, and operate the boat that way. So it's a, a complex operation to be able to fit all that um, in ultimately what is the same hull as it was originally. It's all very, has to be very carefully choreographed because you start with the broad strokes, the gyros, the motors, the bow thrusters, everything like that, and then you have to make everything else sort of fit around that and still have a functioning private yacht. I mean, we're trying to maximize the space in the forward accommodations. Um, you know, some areas being, uh, you know, more luxurious guest quarters and others being convertible uh, bunks for uh, a, a, a plethora of race crew that, that might want to stay on board. Um, so, you know, getting things like the gyro in the boat and moved into its space so that we could really start on what is a not a you know a, a simple task it's a complex area you know ensuring that we have all this um, all these wants packed into a fairly small area when you start to divvy it up and it really couldn't start until the hull was finished until the bottom was done until some of this major equipment is put in the boat 
there's an order of operations with the boat and it just can't happen until some of these items are, are behind us. A lot of preparation has been building up the past couple of months for finally installing the gyro. We're very excited there, so with a lot of preparation, loading the gyro in, making sure everything fits, everything's snug, and everything is secure the way it's supposed to be. The gyro is stored up at our other facility up the hill, so we uh, went up there initially with our box truck and went to put that gyro in there, and it was too heavy for the truck. So we, uh, we waited and went back up with our We've got a large 14,000 pound flatbed trailer and uh, we put it on that with the forklift instead and got it down the hill and that all worked out much better than, than overloading our, uh, our truck. Hold it. We finally had the crane come in to uh, load the gyro in the boat. And, you know, the gyro weighs as much as a large engine, 3,100 pounds. Uh, so it's not an insignificant thing to lift up. I mean, we certainly can't do it here in the shop, which is with a forklift or anything like that. Uh, we had, you know, bring a proper crane company, uh, the same guys who did the tanks, the same guys who did the engine and the generators originally, so they're, we're familiar with them. And let these straps come like this and let the heavy part come down, get it through the hole, and then... You throw it on the, on the heavy parts down there? We had a lot of straps on the, on the gyro, again, to make sure it wasn't just a straight pick, again, because of us having to, to tilt it a little bit to get through the opening that we had. And then we had a few safety lines on it too, just in case anything parted, you know, and we didn't want to drop this right, this very expensive piece of equipment. Still not clear on this side. Yeah, but you're gonna gain a ton. Yeah. You ready to come down? Yeah, come on down. Five inches or something? I'd say more than that. Okay. Five, four, three, two, one, stop. We lifted it up square, but in a way that we could tilt it slightly to get it through the hatch. Uh, the opening in the doghouse on the main deck is only so large. Just like the engine, it had to tilt a little bit to get down uh, the hole. And then once it was down below, then we could square it up again, set it down you know, on a wooden cradle, on the wooden cradle that it got shipped with. It goes up under the carpet there. Is what it does. Yeah. Brought it in, and then we had two big I-beams that we braced off of the tops of the tank, water tanks. And then we, then we barely had enough room, but we had to lift it just high enough to take the pressure off of its crate slide that crate out. Then we could set it down on blocks. And we had beam trolleys and chain falls, and we were able to then, yeah, pick it up and slide it, roll it across, you know, hanging on those I-beams, and then we lowered it down onto its mounts. Now that the gyro is, is installed in the boat, it, it's kind of funny, the last several months have been um, have felt rather strange to me. This is the first time I've installed a gyro on a boat or seen one uh, installed. 
So it, uh, it felt a little bit like overkill up until now. The double planking, the stainless steel floor timbers that go from stem to stern. But when you see this machine down in the boat, it suddenly starts to make sense. It's, it's an amazing piece of equipment and it does put an enormous amount of stress on the boat. So uh, with that in mind, we, we overbuilt the boat so that uh, she can withstand the forces that are gonna be put on her. Gyro's finally in. Dan Scudder, she's not quite, not torqued down yet, but right. she's in. Now, now it's time to uh, build everything around it. Yeah. The gyro is in. So there's a couple different ways that, that boats are stabilized um, these days. Uh, fin stabilizers, which, which have these for all intents and purposes, little wings coming out the side of a boat have been the mainstay in boat stabilization probably since about the 70s. Um, and that is something that, that we have done in the past prior to the, to the, the, the gyro stabilizer uh, technology coming about or coming to maturity. One of the downfalls of fin stabilizers is that they point load the hull too much. And in a wooden boat, you're always trying to spread the load over a larger portion of the structure. And so having just two fins sticking out the side of the boat, um, we end up seeing a lot of movement in the hull because, because all the riding moment of the stabilization of the boat is all happening from two spots. Fins are located below the water line. They require the boat to be in motion and water to be flowing over these wings. Uh, to be able to, to, to stabilize the boat. And then they turn as necessary to sort of square things up. Uh, whereas the, the gyro stabilizer, it's all internal to the boat. So the gyro has a, has a large um, stainless steel flywheel that spins on a vertical axis. So it's spinning like this at 5,000 RPM. Looks like a big, heavy motorcycle tire. Inside the gyrosphere is a large weighted flywheel. That flywheel in that sphere is in a vacuum. The gyro is encased in a vacuum in this sphere with the bearings on the top and the bottom that are liquid cooled. The gyro takes probably 45 minutes to spool up, so you have to turn it on before you plan on leaving the dock. And then when you shut it down at the end of the day, it might take two hours to stop spinning. Wow. If the boat rolls to starboard, it imparts a force to port and vice versa in order to uh, dampen the roll characteristics of any boat. It's an amazing piece of equipment and uh, the first time I felt it, I, it, I don't know, it, it was a very, it was, it was a strange, strange sort of sensation. You know, you can walk down a companionway without putting your hands out and that kind of stuff. And you know, with a, with a, a boat like Coastal Queen and her intended purpose, that's, that's a big deal.